Hi there, folks. Welcome to another edition of Space Talks with Z, uh, one of the America's Future Series uh, content features uh, where we interview uh, amazing technical leaders, policymakers, uh, and uh, decision makers from uh, the US and uh, around the world. Uh, with us today, we have some very special guests with whom we will be discussing uh, the topic of uh, fusion and not just uh, fusion as we hear about it from the national labs and the energy sector, but a little bit of a different perspective, one that perhaps promises results sooner and uh, of equally important magnitude uh, as uh, fusion as an energy source. And uh, I of course wanna thank you for joining us. I uh, also thank our sponsors, Millennium uh, Space uh, Systems and also uh, TGM Core. Uh, well, without them, uh, we can't continue to do this. So we appreciate uh, um, their sponsorship. Uh, with us, we have uh, Professor uh, Charlie Ryan of uh, Southampton University U uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, we have uh, the CEO and the head of operations uh, as well of Pulsar, the CEO being uh, Richard Dynan and the uh, head of operations being uh, Dr. James Lambert. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and, and welcome. Uh, and we'll get to know uh, uh, each of you a little more uh, as we move forward. But before, rather than spend a ton of time on intros and things, I really just want to jump into the subject um, of, of fusion. And, uh, you know, I also have a little bit of a background in fusion, having, work, having worked on the, um, uh, at the, you know, lasers, lasers, nothing but lasers, also known as Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Uh, for a little bit of time uh, and helped uh, build uh, the National Ignition Facility, which does um, inertial confinement fusion, um, which is one type of fusion. But, you know, before kind of I, I jump into that, perhaps uh, let's just ask the question for the audience who may not be familiar with this in general. Um, what is fusion versus uh, fission, uh, uh, James, and maybe what types of fusion uh, are there? Sure. Um, yeah, Z, uh, really nice to be uh, uh, on your show. Um, and just a little bit more about me. I'm a physicist uh, by training. I did my uh, undergraduate um, and postgraduate study at Bristol University here uh, in the UK on the very theoretical end of uh, the intersection between physics and computer science. And I've since found myself spending more and more time with a, with a wrench in my hand, uh, bolting things together in the, in the space industry, which is uh, uh, really exciting. But yeah, fusion, fusion versus fission. So we're talking about, uh, whereas in a conventional nuclear power station, it's all about splitting atoms apart uh, to liberate nuclear energy. Uh, fusion is all about joining them together. So um, I'm sure many of your uh, viewers will be aware that fusion is the reaction that uh, powers the sun. So it joins uh, light hydrogen nuclei to form heavier ones um, and releases a vast amount of energy in the process and we've been chasing after this dream of commercializing fusion for energy uh, for a very very long time uh, certainly since the uh, you know, early uh, early half of the 20th century um, and we're excited to sort of begin exploring its value as a as a propulsion technology because we think that a huge amount of, uh, of expertise has flowed into fusion as an energy concept but really, there's a lot to be uh, understood uh, in its, uh, its promise as a as a propulsion, as a propulsion tech as well. Okay, so so there's a couple different flavors of fusion as well, right? You can mm. shoot lasers at things to compress yeah. them and kind of cause that fusion reaction to happen, um, or you can uh, take it, take take whatever you're gonna gas you're gonna make use for your fusion reaction and and um, spin it in in a toroid like a donut shape and then try to compress that uh, into a Absolutely. line of fusion, right? And both of those are the power um, formats. Um, but you mentioned um, that uh, you're, you, you and the team at Pulsar are more uh, focused on using fusion for, for propulsion. Um, Correct. And, and so, you know, I'd love to ask uh, Richard uh, and um, uh, Professor uh, Charlie Ryan, who is a professor of aeronautics, uh, or sorry, astronautics, um, no, might you know both of whom know a thing or two about propulsion to to kind of jump in and, and one uh, you know help us think about what propulsion means in general and and then you know also you know uh, I know you've thought about this deeply you know Richard why why fusion for propulsion rather than power first 
Right. Um, so I guess when people talk about nuclear, everyone thinks very bad bomb, uh, waste, bad for the environment, dangerous bombs um, at war. Um, and it's something that, you know, most people think, do we really want more of this in, in the world? Um, and what people don't understand is, is, you know, when Einstein first discovered the power locked up in um, the atomic nucleus, humans being humans, we did the first thing, we went to try and make a weapon out of it, which is, which is very sad. Um, and being at you know, the era of, era of um, the global wars at the time, it became an imperative and a, and, a, and a rush for the atomic bomb. And actually that power that Einstein actually said that he wishes he could uninvent um, after seeing the results of the bomb, you know, they, that gave us the ability to do the worst thing we've ever done, sadly. But on the other side, as James said, of that scale of taking really, really heavy atoms and, and trying to sort of split them apart, or, or as they leak particles, create the heat out of them for, for, for power stations today, which is, by the way, a very, a very efficient way of, um, of getting power. Uh, on the completely other side of this power, of this um, technology, if you like, is fusion, and will give us the ability to do the best thing we have ever done. Um, yeah. It's nature's chosen energy source, right? The flowers grow towards it. Um, when you close your eyes and you look at the sun and you feel the sort of power that is fusion um now that's a very very good force it also happens to be nuclear um so we i think we tarnish the word nuclear we tarnish it all over the place you know you could almost call them plutonium bombs uranium bombs mm -hmm. calling them nuclear is very vague um you know mm -hmm. we're all made up yeah so i think we need to get off the nuclear thing <laughs> um because there's a lot of good to come from that's nuclear. right that's right it, it doesn't right. have to be a bad word any <clears throat> at all it doesn't, um, so it, it, so, so let me let me let's before we jump back into why why fusion for propulsion, having kind of understood more now that fu fusion is not something to be um, not only uh, not afraid of, but to recognize that this is as as Richard uh, you know put it so well, nature's chosen uh, energy source. Um, but you know, Professor uh, Ryan, what might be also useful is if you could help us frame how to think about space propulsion, right? You know, both getting off Earth, then once you're up there and, and what what scales, what is what different technologies you use and what different, um, at different uh, scales and for different tasks. Because people seem to think it's all the same, but it's not just a bunch of different types of rocket fuel. Yeah, in my job at um, University of Southampton as a associate professor here, um, I do space propulsion. It's my sort of, uh, my research topic of choice. And it is, really interesting times in space propulsion at the moment. Um, first, you've got launch vehicle side of things. Launch vehicle is a completely big chemical rocket engine, kind of quite different thing, lots of stuff going on there. But we're interested, we're looking at my interest as well. Mm -hmm. It's in space propulsion. In space propulsion as well is going through a huge transformational change at the moment. And uh, you know it's moving away from burning stuff in a chemical rocket to using these iron thrusters to basically accelerate ions out of a plasma. And this has now become the standard type of propulsion used by spacecraft, by far the most common. Every one of these mega constellations of Elon Musk satellites, or you know, in the UK, there's one web mega constellation as well. They all use these iron thrusters on board. But it's kind of now this has become so standard, it's kind of like, what next kind of thing? What's gonna happen next in the world of space propulsion, in particular iron thrusters, this method of creating high velocity ions out of it and being a more efficient type of propulsion. What next in terms of propulsion going forward? Now, how are we gonna match you know, the increasing growth in the space technology sector where it's getting to the point where anything goes in the space tech sector, you know, is, especially in space at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's so, so let me follow, let me let me kind of follow up in in terms of one question. So the these ion thrusters that have now kind of become a ubiquitous technology, yeah. right? Um, how far can they take us? Can can ion thrusters take uh, take us from Earth to the Moon or Earth to Mars, or are they only relevant in orbit? Um, and how do you break down the way you think in terms of different types of propulsion methods, 
what is relevant for what scales. I would love to kind of think about it in terms of how do we frame that. Mm. So I think I thought that might have a sweet spot for kind of spacecraft of a medium size, you know, that matches mm. what's kind of all these mega constellations have. They have sort of satellites of hundreds of kilometers or so, hundreds of kilograms. Right, and right. For, for larger kind of um, satellites, it kind of starts to move away from ISOs. So there's a few out there. You know, most of these sort of these Hall ISOs is the standard sort of type. Mm -hmm. One sort of up there on my shelf kind of thing. Ah, I thought I could see it. Yeah. <laughs> is that a Hall effect thruster? It is a Hall effect thruster. Oh, very cool. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's 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 you know, one of our Hall effect thrusters here at the Hampton. Uh, um, very cool. But that's that's a kind of Hall, that's the size of a thrust you'll see on a small satellite. But now people are like going back to the moon and people are going to create a space station at the moon. People are going to go to Mars in the next decades. So, you know, how do we get there? How do we do something that allows you to go to these places and to go to places with large spacecraft, with people on board, perhaps carrying large amounts of cargo? These kind of big questions are the kind of key things that, you know, we need to look at. We need to, I think, uh, I think uh, the iron thruster community has become a little stale. You know, yep. it's you know, it's obsessed with Hall iron thrusters or other typical times of iron thrusters. And we do need to think about what's next, what's next going to be on the uh, horizon and start moving the field onwards from <laughs> technology that's kind of made in Russia 30 years ago or so, 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Wow. I mean, uh, that's that's a real big, big statement to say that at fundamental level, this is 30 old technology that we're still optimizing. And it might've been 30 years old, maybe 10 years ago, right? It might be actually closer to 40 years old at this point, right? So, so this, the field needs, needs a kick in the pants. It um, does a bit, it right? does, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mean, now we kind of come to, to the crux of, of where we've been kind of leading to is fusion for space propulsion. And, May, I, I don't know, maybe who wants to jump in? Maybe Richard, yeah. I know, or James, um, but what does that mean when we talk about fusion for propulsion in space? Well, can I, I'd like to just connect some dots before sure. I answer that, if I may, if I may Z. Yeah, so I think yeah. the, the, one of the core ideas that we're dancing around here, but what is it that makes one type of space propulsion different from the other is a major distinguishing feature is just how quickly it fires material out of the back of it. Um, and so if you, if you, if you look at a comparison between, uh, like a chemical rocket and an ion thrust, you have a vast difference in exhaust speed. So you might think that, uh, that the rocket, like the, like the rocket in the, uh, in the picture behind me, um, this looks like the exhaust uh, velocity is very high. It looks like it's traveling fast, but it's maybe five or six times the speed of sound. Um, sim similar, you know, you, you'll get a comparable speed with any kind of launch vehicle. But if you then switch and look at what, what a, a Hall effect thruster puts out, you're looking at something a factor of 10 to 100 times faster, right? So vastly increased uh, exhaust speeds, which means that it doesn't have to fire out as much propellant right. to maneuver your spacecraft. So this is really where uh, the technological advance needs to happen. The whole key here is we want to get higher exhaust velocities so that we can carry less propellant. And this makes sense, right? Because you look at a rocket, mostly you're just looking at an enormous fuel tank. Uh, right, and that's right, right. And you can, and, and if it's momentum, if it's just MV, right, then you can't just keep going to heavier and heavier molecules. You're very, you're very fundamentally limited. So exactly. the, only, so the, the only game in town is to increase the, the exit velocity. Yeah, we've got to increase the exit velocity and we've got to do it in a way that means that not only can you output really high speed exhausts, you also need to be able to output high speed exhaust with a reasonable amount of actual material leaving your rocket. It can't be that you're expelling a thousand, a thousandth of a gram uh, per hour at an incredible speed. You just don't get enough thrust. So we're looking for ways to increase both of these key values, exhaust velocity and the, the mass, or actually how much exhaust you're putting out. That's what's gonna give you real sort of game changing uh, propulsion tech. Um, and that's why we're to, to cycle back to your original question. That's why yeah. we're interested in, in fusion tech because um, you, you ran through a, a few a few examples of how we try to achieve fusion conditions on Earth. You have, you can you can fire lasers 
uh, at, the, at the gases that you're trying to heat. You can you can suspend them in magnetic fields, but you're always doing this in a, with them in a state of, of plasma, so a very right. very very hot gas. Um, right. And so you're already looking at ex having extremely high particle speeds. So if you can find a way to can bring these particles up to a high speed and direct them out of the back of your spacecraft, you now have the potential for a revolutionary form of propulsion. Um, so to answer your question uh, that I think you asked about seven minutes ago, <laughs> um, the, the reason this is why we're excited about fusion. It's the opportunity to give you very high exhaust speeds and um, potentially high flow rates. So high thrust, high efficiency. Uh, and this is good for this is good for everything you want to do in space. You're going to have drastically improved payloads. You're going to be able to go 10 times as far uh, in, in, in a tenth of the time. It's a, it would be truly transformative. Right. So when we say truly transformative, um, I, I mean, maybe Richard or, or, or Professor Ryan, you want to jump in here. Um, what types of use cases are now and uh, would, would you expect it to unlock um, mm. moving forward? Uh, what is it? What do you think is is really uh, it going to enable that that the current uh, you know technologies don't really do, whether because of time or mass or or, or other considerations? I was going to say one um, one thing I think is important to say before we go into the fusion thing. Sorry to keep taking steps back before we go forward. Is that the, the, the high speeds you're talking about from, you know, Hall effect thrusters and grid ion thrusters and propelling ions from a very hot plasma, plasma being the, the basically fourth state of matter, your solid liquid gas plasma, like, mm -hmm. you know, that's why when people are asking, may, may ask what a plasma is, um, that's why, you know, you, don't, you, you know, I don't want to confuse people in that, but these technologies are very useful in the vacuum of space. The problem is getting them into space because these, often these technologies don't work in space. So to answer your question, Z, you know, a fusion engine isn't going to be the, the technology to get us from the ground into low Earth orbit. Okay. We'll be on. You're going to need, as you know, Z, I mean, but you're going to need to have um, a different type of propulsion for that. And, and one of the things that, and we're getting good at that, one, one of the problems you've got is this equation called the delta V, right, which is where right. you've got, uh, as you said, a rocket is basically a massive fuel tank. And the more weight you have on a rocket, the more fuel you need to get it into space. And the more fuel, the more weight. So then right. you need more fuel, and yep. the rocket gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which means it needs more fuel, which means it needs more weight, which needs more size. And this equation goes against you. And so if we can increase the efficiency, and that's why it locks methane, liquid hydrogen, all these technologies that are coming to, to the foreplay now that you've seen, you know, as rockets go up more and more, right. are getting more efficient. We're not out to change that. Very importantly, we think that that technology is, is not maturing, but it's mature enough that, you know, and, and fusion isn't the right technology to replace that anyway. So you're going to see fire like that coming out the back of rocket going from the ground into Earth. I mean, still, you know. Yeah, for a long times. time. Till we, till we invent some new physics, maybe, right? But let's give ourselves a pat on the back. Mac 5 isn't the worst thing to have done. Um, but um, once you're in Earth orbit, that's when the technologies that Charlie, Professor Ryan, was talking about, which is so transformative, because space is, who gives, you know, seven speed of speed is nothing in space. When you're talking about, you know, our closest galaxy is 100 million light years away. At the speed of light, it would take you 100 million yeah. years. We're never going to never going to get there. Mm. But there are planets like our closest four, star, our three star system is Alpha Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away. Mm. I mean, nowhere we're going to get there by setting fire to stuff. Right. Forget it. Right. We it's have to nuts. use either the electrostatic force, which is what Charlie is. Sorry, Professor Rani, who is an absolute specialist and has has analysed all of our um, our Hall effect thrusters, which are exactly that. And he is, there is very few brains who, are, who understand that technology better. But fusion is not using electrostatic or electromagnetism, it's using the strong force, the force start up in the atom that will give us not only the speeds, which are a thousand times more, but also their mass. And therefore maybe, Professor Ryan, if I can ask you to jump in and explain a little bit more to people about why that's important. I think, yeah. This you know this iron thruster on my shelf here you know it's uh it's uh it's a tiny force you know it's it's absolutely tiny force it doesn't it's it's your there's a general rule if you have a high exhaust velocity your thrust decreases kind of thing it goes one over the sort of the mm. thrust and so you get more more exhaust velocity you get a lot less thrust generally and that's exactly the case for these iron thrusters here 
And so that, that starts to that produces a force of a piece of paper on your hand, this kind of level. Um, <coughs> you, you know, now people are thinking, well, is there anything that breaks these curves kind of thing, breaks through this equation and allows you to actually be in that sweet spot of kind of high thruster power ratio, but also high exhaust velocity. So, you know, you're away from this downward trend of, you know, as, as the exhaust velocity increases, thrust goes down. Right. Something up mm. in the sort of top right corner of that figure mm. means you get that beautiful sweet spot. And that's one of the things that perhaps can do it is kind of a fusion iron drive in space. You know, and there could be very good applications in going to Mars in very short periods of time, in sort of periods of a month or two. There's something yeah. along those lines, and also going out towards the outer planets as well, going and doing these kind of you remember Voyager? Yep. Yeah, you know, Voyager one and two, they did these grand tours, you know, around the outer outer planets, you know, but that's mm -hmm. a very dependent on the alignment of the uh, planets. You could yeah. do a grand tour of the outer planets using a fusion iron drive, going straight there, straight to the next one, straight to the next one. So, you know, by having a high thrust and a high exhaust velocity, that kind of allows you to achieve things that are not possible at the moment. Mm. Fascinating. I mean, another thing, if I can jump in for another application, yeah. Um, yeah. I know people have, people have mooted the concept of being of a, of a space tug as well. So if you wanted to launch spacecraft that carry only a very small amount of propellant, you could launch them into a lower orbit and then you could have a reusable spacecraft that just comes along and pulls them, tugs them into whatever orbit you wanted them in. Um, and that that spacecraft is going to need a really super efficient, but also super versatile propulsion system. Fusion is a really natural there's, thing. There's a great example is the, the lun next Lunar Gateway space station. Right. Mm. It's going to be held there using big eye thrusters like the one on board here, like the one on my shelf. Mm. About five times the size of that. But it's going to run out of fuel every two years. So they're so going to have gonna to lose figure out how to go. Station, or you're going to have to refuel it every two yeah. years. Yeah. You know, That's you need right. something. You know, you're going to have this economy in space where it's going to be backwards and forwards from different places, being able to have adaptable, flexible operation of your spacecraft. Um, mm. You know, things are going to move on from little boxes that sit in orbit and take photos. So, so what are the, what are the steps that people are taking, Pulsar included and, and others, to to make this happen? Has has this technology hasn't has it been fielded in space yet? Mm, not yet, but it's an no. old concept. <clears throat> it's an old concept. It dates back um, certainly to the nineteen seventies and, uh, and possibly before. Um, so it's one of those annoying things that um, it's a wonderful idea, but everyone's attention has been taken out. Uh, after fusion as an energy source. Um, and so we have some really ex exciting concepts that urgently need uh, hashing out and haven't really received the funding or attention that they, that they deserve. Um, and you're beginning to see more and more work, like the work that we do. Um, you're seeing there's some really cool work being done uh, out in Princeton as well um, on the concepts and reactor concepts we need to get this stuff going. But um, to answer your question, the, 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 the chief uh, challenge really is temperatures. We need, we need to generate extremely high temperatures um, in, in order to uh, in order to fuse the fusion fuels uh, that we would right. be using. So that's where the that's where the real uh, hard engineering is probably going to be. Um, <clears throat> break down exactly why, in terms mm. of the fact that you know nuclear fusion is about trying to copy what a star does. And stars are very hot. And yet, you know, we, we've always wondered, we've always looked at the stars for direction, but we need to emulate them. We need to copy what they're doing and their technology. And we have from, from Earth, we've studied them to the point we really understand what they're doing and the reaction is fusion. But we can't build a star on Earth because we A, we don't have the space and B, we can't just use gravity to hold a ball of plasma. Um, and, and crush it to immense temperatures. We, have, we can't do that. So scientists on Earth, the reason that James was talking about temperature is because if we want to build this little star, we've got to, we have a genius method. One of the methods is, is to actually, how do you have a star which is burning at 300 million degrees mm. anywhere? Uh, 
because it would melt everything, right? So one of the ways of doing that, which, we're trying to, which we have done very successfully on Earth, is, is because a plasma is charged, because it's largely protons, um, it, they'll feel an electromagnetic field. So we can use a ring of magnets to basically hold that plasma away from the edges in a donut shape and squeeze that in like the same way lightning will squeeze a, a lightning conductor and crush it. Mm. We use that same electromagnetic force to crush a ring of plasma in a vacuum chamber where it doesn't touch the sides. And it gives us a, a, a ring of a little star and massive temperatures. And the, the, the world, as James said right now, is, is really focused with billions and trillions uh, to use that energy to fix the world's power problems because if we can do that we can harness a star on earth which is what we're doing at ITER at the moment which is a big reactor in France 20 28 billion euro project if we can do that then we have solved humans energy needs we're done so that's a hell of a hell of a promise and that's why fusion gets called the energy source it's either the holy grail because it really is the answer it is a million times more powerful than the combustion or chemical reaction one drop of deuterium is about 50,000 barrels of oil. The statistics are stunning. But at the same time, there's two promises coming out of fusion. One is we power ourselves forever, cleanly. The other one is that we can leave our solar system. We are that species that can actually take off to the stars because we need a power. Can't do it by setting fire to stuff like cavemen. You know, it's got to be nuclear. And that is the good side of nuclear. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what you're describing is is another humans discovering fire moment, fundamentally in terms of what it age. Definitely, it's, it's a it's coming out of combustion age going into fusion age. Yep. And once we're a species that can control fusion, it's not like getting oh we can do smaller iPads or we've got the internet. It's literally we are a we we're a planet that's learned how to build a star. Mm. A yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So so. To bring it down to kind of, you know, how or how is that going to also be what applied in in this? Is, is it the same type of um, uh, compression and 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 a ring of a star that 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 powers the the fusion propulsion drive, or is it a different kind of usage of fusion? And and you know, people have been working on the fusion as a power source for a very long time. Um, really, really, since mm. you know, 19, uh, basically, um, since nineteen, you know, forty something, um, and yet it's not there. But, mm. yeah. but, but what James, what we've been talking about is that is that fusion is there in terms of what mm. it could do for propulsion in space. So yeah. I just want to understand the difference between how yeah. how they're being it's being applied. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's fun to talk about fusion as a propulsion tech and fusion as energy because they, they both share this core fundamental bit of things that, hey, we're in nuclei together. But actually, from an engineering point of view, the two concepts are, it couldn't be more different. Um, the sort of terrestrial energy projects that you see pursued um, are looking at a particular fusion reaction, namely joining one type of hydrogen called deuterium to another type of hydrogen uh, called tritium. Uh, and this reaction releases its energy uh, in particles called neutrons. And these come with one big problem, which is you need to surround your reactor with very thick st stainless steel walls to absorb that radiation. Um, it also means that because they're given off as neutrons, you can't easily direct them out of the back of your, of your, rea of, of your reactor. Yeah, they're neutral, so you can't, you can't use they're neutral. Sort of field. So, yeah. so the propulsion community has to look at a completely different reaction. We have, we have to look at a reaction that gives off energy in the form of charged particles, which can be directed. And so that means we look at completely different reaction, reactor designs. So we're not looking, if okay. any of your, if you're, any of your, any of your uh, viewers are, are keen fusion people, they, we're not really looking at tokamaks or stellarators or any of the, the ones that fusion energy people are familiar with. We have right. to look at different devices. We have to look at linear uh, devices so that you can confine a plasma and then give it somewhere to go, um, and that you have to you have to release your energy as charged particles so that they can be deflected out of the back. So um, perhaps the most promising fuel right now is uh, is a combination of deuterium and and a form of hydrogen uh, helium called helium three. Um, this is a good, almost a neutronic 
so no neutrons uh, reaction. Um, it's the disadvantage is it requires higher temperatures. So that's where the engineering challenge lies. Uh, but yeah, radically different, uh, radically different uh, reactor designs. Um, and the advantage really is that they are, uh, they, they, are, they are lighter because you don't have this thick uh, steel blanket. And just because of their geometry, you can use weaker magnetic fields. So actually some of the engine, you catch a, you get a break uh, ah, on some of the engineering. Some bit. of the engineering is a bit easier actually than, than it would be if you're making a tokamak. So we have the, we have the, the temperature problem is the, is, the, is the tough one, but the magnetic field problem, which is kind of the Achilles heel of a lot of terrestrial fusion energy projects. That's, that's what we catch a break on. That's, that's a little easier for us. So, I mean, that's, that's really interesting because what what that also means is that clearly they must you, you, these the, what you what uh, when you're optimizing for for propulsion you can build it to not be the size of a building right when yeah. you think of all the fusion facilities in yeah. the world right now they're all gigantic buildings um, mm -hmm. right you know whether it's Eater whether it's Laser Megajoule or the National Ignition Facilities yeah. or Fermi Lab um, yeah. for that matter you know any of these facilities are gigantic yeah. um, but clearly when you're optimizing for propulsion, um, a rocket engine is still big, but it's not as big as a building. It's only as big yeah. as a small car. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think I think Charlie has one behind him as well, which is just infuriating to me. Yeah, I know. It's impossibly <laughs> smart. Yeah, yeah, no, no. See, he, he, I told you he had the best background. <laughs> I told you he had the I best background. I thought had a good background. And until and Charlie joined the call. It doesn't work, though, so it just is. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. Out of service. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, yeah, Z, you're quite right. Um, uh, the sort of the sort of device, fusion devices that propulsion, uh, fusion propulsion, people are looking at are in the sort of hundred megawatt range. They're far smaller, and that all comes about because of the different fuel type, um, and that's why you just can't really draw a meaningful connection between. Um, this is the engineering of terrestrial fusion energy, and this is the engineering of uh, space propulsion fusion. They're just completely different things, uh, even though the core physics of joining nuclei is the same. Mm. Should we go into why they're why they're so different? Yeah, I mean it's it's just this this use of aneutronic fuels. And no, I mean, the fact that you don't have <clears throat> you don't have neutrons to deal with. I mean to, to just to understand, I mean, you know, Z yeah. is actually a, a neutron physicist. So yes, he is. definitely gets it. But the the other thing is that if you want to build a, a power station, you've got this condition of plasma, which we call a Wilson criterion mm. fusion triple product, um, which is is like there's one one milestone and, and humanity have done a pretty good job at getting there but then it, for a power station you've got these neutrons james is talking about flying out in all directions and, and to use their kinetic energy as heat we need to have about a meter of steel in every direction around your your plasma to absorb those neutrons and and use yeah. the kinetic energy to to heat those the shields and and that metal is is being exposed to a little sun so it's going to degrade. So you need to have a robotic changing some systems around that to change out those mm. walls as they get degraded, or, or some salt water bath, which is another sort of, or liquid metals is something that people are looking at. But still, it is not small. Then around that, if you don't do anything with that heat, you need a steam turbine and a big one. So we're back then to Carnot make, then again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And then if you it's want to make a power, yeah. you have the power station infrastructure around that, and you need to get the local sun off and you need the government. And, blah, blah, blah. and so this is just by very nature, a very big, very time consuming project when it comes to fusion for energy. In mm. space, it's already a vacuum. So you don't need a vacuum chamber. You don't need any metal walls to slow neutrons because there aren't going to be any. Well, there might be one or two, but really it's an neutronic reaction as James said. Yeah. Yeah. So on top of that, we don't need to have any you know, robotic changing or liquid walls, we need any of that. We don't, we don't need to actually be efficient in terms of, we can actually feed our own fuels or we can, might even couple it up with a fission reactor. You know, to keep driving it on. There's, the, we're, we are under none of the, the power station sort of infrastructure um, of, uh, sort of obstacles. We can make something very small, create the same reaction at the core of a power station and forget the 15-year the, the infrastructure build around it, which is why we, we think that, that a propulsion is probably, um, I'd be more bullish about this, but I, I think it's likely to, to have some meaningful um, demonstrations before anybody's powering the grid just because of the mm. infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's, the, and that's a really amazing statement to think about, is that we're going to demonstrate fusion in space before we actually apply it in a meaningful fashion um, on Earth. Um, what, mm. what, a, what a heck of a 
what a heck of a time to be alive, frankly. Right? <laughs> uh, I mean, when, when he when he says things things like that, right? Um, it's, if you were to say, it, it it's so hard to do fusion on Earth. It really is. Mm. If you could choose, I know. <laughs> I do fusion. I do it in space on Earth. <laughs> you would choose to do it in space because you've got half. You know, you've got the temperature right. You've got a <sighs> vacuum. Doing it on Earth is really hard. Well, um, I mean, hey, maybe maybe may that's maybe that maybe that's a project too. Is is the orbital you know fusion uh, stations? Um, yeah. Well, but, yeah. Uh, no, so, uh, 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 Professor Ryan, you were saying. I was just uh, going to come in on the power side of things in space as well. I think you know I mentioned about doing mm -hmm. a grand tour to the outer solar system using you know some uh, fusion ion drive or something that offers high thrust and high high uh, you know exhaust velocity as well. But uh, you know. Is a problem with these ion thrusters as, as on the shelf is that they're quite power hungry, you know, and actually most of the power is coming from solar panels. And so this is issue that this doesn't work once you get outside the asteroid belt. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not really a power source, it's just a thruster. And it's something just else on the system is powering right. that. Yeah. So these, a grand tour using an ion thruster, no matter how big your ion thruster is, a conventional ion thruster, is not possible because they're so power hungry. And I just Sorry to interrupt. I just want to feed you a question differently. What technology would be appropriate? Give me more than give me give me two technologies. That actually, if you wanted to go to in a human lifetime outside the asteroid belt, or you wanted to go to another planet, what technologies are possible within within physics that could get us there? Mm. <laughs> that's a that's a broad question. So I think uh, there are. A there are a few kind of options out there kind of thing. You know, there is kind of people of tried and like the project Breakthrough Starshot, which was looking at kind of using right. solar sails to kind of go to Alpha Centauri. Um, you know, that's uh, one option. It could be along those lines, but the mass looks really tricky there. You know, you get really hot, your thing probably would melt. Um, mm. Maybe also nuclear fission kind of engines as well. They are also the other one that, is towards a sweet spot as well in terms of a high thrust and a high exhaust velocity as well. But no one's done anything mm -hmm. on a nuclear fission engine for coming up to 50, 60 years now. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, as we're talking about fission ion thrusters as well, those could also be an option to go try and try to move on, move out, you know, mm. move towards. Yeah, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that, I mean, there's also another another idea of what someone was talking about creating with lasers, like these battery at, at, at NIF, mm. um, ripping a hole in, in space using very powerful lasers and creating a little black hole, yeah. which you can ride, <laughs> this black hole, <laughs> nine times feet of light. So you can literally harness your little black hole and, and use it to drag you out outside or i mean that's another concept but what i'm really driving at here is if i want to get alpha centauri which is four light years away there is only one real technology that could actually get me there in a human lifetime and that is fusion we aren't going to leave this solar system in a human lifetime by harnessing a black hole or we might one day <laughs> It's, right now uh, we are doing right now i think we we're, we're liable to do something <laughs> you know worse on accident <laughs> yeah. yeah you know fusion particle exhaust speeds are, are calculated to give us about 350 kilo, kilometers a second so that is not the sweet spot that sets a new sweet spot mm -hmm. that's that's actually the ability to get on a spaceship and actually we could in a, in the same lifetime we can see a different set of start of suns. Mm. You know, we can visit another, you know, a, a planet around a G-type <laughs> star. There, we can't do that with fission. Mm. Can't do that with, with iron thrusters. We can't. We can't do it with solar Something. cells. So, mm. I, I, think so. I, think, I think it's beautiful as well. That is, you know, as an academic, we can, you know, we live in a quite dry area myself. You know, it's quite, we're quite naturally conservative. And, and it's awesome there are so many visionaries kind of thing out there at the moment who are thinking of kind of like trying to do stuff like this as well and trying mm -hmm. to move out there and do it why are they not making black holes <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I i don't remember i know of the concept but i i don't remember but i exactly what the number was but um 
but I remember good. when they when they postulated the 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 intensity of laser it would take to do such a thing. Um, I I think most of us who read that said, oh yeah, that's basically science fiction, um, yeah. because there's not even a concept of how to create a laser to do that. Um, mm. uh, it, because because typically what you end up doing is with lasers you 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 can't get the it's very hard to get the spot size lower and lower and lower. So, so what you, what, what, you're, what the, the criteria is, is um, basically watts uh, per centimeter squared. And, and so the game turns into um, the tiniest pulse length for all of the photons you can. And so it's just, I know folks who work on attosecond lasers, right? Not even picosecond, but attosecond lasers. Beautiful. And so, you know, the technologies <laughs> to do some of these things are, my point is, about this though, is, is to even consider some of these concepts Right, the technologies are so exotic; they start mm. becoming borderline sci-fi very yeah. fast. Right. Well, they whereas, did. whereas, whereas the concept of of the fusion of the fusion drive, you know, from what I'm hearing is that hey, you're working on it now. There's metal, to, you know. There's one right behind the professor <laughs> on the shelf. You know, um, I mean, this is, this is not you know in the realm of oh, you know, the, the blurry edge of of sci-fi and sci-fi. Right. It, this, yeah. You know, we're talking about something that's in our hands right now. And, and but so, we're talking about the fact that we've already done it. You know, Jet in, in 1997 got 16 megawatts of energy from a fusion bubble. You know, mm -hmm. Mars upgrade has just achieved a, a great fusion burn. I can't remember, James, what was it, 50? Can remind me of the uh, I, I don't remember the number, but yes, I, yeah. Anyway, that was, that was I, I, ITER, ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in Provence, or ITER, if you're French, if, whatever, um, that is going to achieve what's close to a 10 times net energy gain. That is in 2025 first plasma. This is really close. And this is fusion yeah. on Earth. And that reaction yeah. alone, forget the infrastructure. It just means we can do it. We can do all of this. We can power a planet. Yeah. We can the solar system. <clears throat> that and of a, of a sign. Yeah. And if I can if I can follow up that point by saying the super exciting thing is that although I, mean, I firmly believe you'll see fusion commercialized in space before you see it commercialized. Um, in the form of a power station on Earth. Uh, what's really exciting is that the work we're doing now can kind of piggyback on a lot of the engineering insights that have been gained in fusion. So uh, to bring us back to, uh, to thinking about a fusion propulsion device in space, um, the primary heating technology is going to be some form of RF heating. It's going to be basically some kind of microwave uh, high voltage antenna that is that is going to be heating our plasma and we have a wealth of understanding of how to build these things uh yeah. and scale these things uh thanks to large projects like like ITER uh so it's, it's actually it's kind of exciting that what we're doing now in terms of space-based fusion propulsion uh it really just sort of piggybacks on all this really good work that's been done over over the last few decades uh yeah it's not just this brand new science project that someone invented uh, no, no, it really hooks into uh, it's a key industry that's, you know, at a good level of maturity. Um, but Z, something I wanted to raise, um, and I think we, we were sort of, we sort of skirted around this earlier, was um, the question of power on board mm, spacecraft. Right. And, right. and right. so now if, you, if you're going, if you're going planet hopping, or if mm. you're going all the way to Alpha Centauri, right now, you, 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 it's not enough just to have the good propulsion. If you want to go we've got to keep keep power on the we've got to keep yeah. you know life support uh, on and life support is a is a real amazing money and resource sink yeah yeah hugely and i i i, I annoy myself because i can never quite remember the uh the number here but it stunned me when i heard it that the um you know, the mars curiosity rover we get wonderful photos back and it drives around on, on mars and, it, and it's very very impressive i i remember reading how much power it has at its disposal, how much electrical power it has at its disposal. And it's it's horrifyingly low. Oh yeah, it's uh, almost nothing. It's amazing yeah. that we do what it's we in do. The, it's in the region of hundreds of watts, something yeah. like that. Um, and this is because it's, it's powered off um, an old fashioned nuclear radioisotope system that is just not efficient. Yeah. And most of its energy, it's, it's, so, it's so unfortunate, most of its energy goes to heating up oil in its motors. <laughs> so that it isn't a thick sludge so that they can actually turn. Uh, spacecraft need more energy. The more energy you have on a spacecraft, the more valuable they are, the more they can do. Um, and when there are unforeseen problems, some of that energy has to get, has to get kind of wasted by heating up oil you didn't think you'd have to be heating up. 
uh, or, or whatever your spacecraft is doing. Um, so there's a real need for uh, a new power source on board spacecraft. Uh, this is obviously the other big exciting application uh, in fusion propulsion is that it's it's also putting out a lot of energy, uh, which and some of which can be captured uh, electrically. Uh, so we also have an onboard. This is also an onboard power supply, which is really really exciting. Right. Just massively. with the same yeah. with the same fuel, with the same. It's same just fuel. you're you're just harnessing it. It's there yeah. for the taking, and you're harnessing it, and it's not affecting your thrust either. Exactly right. right. Because so thinking, so yeah. you, yeah. you so it so at, at this point so it's turning it's turning the it, now it's a power plant in the mm. way that um, uh, a jet engine hanging off of a seven four seven or or seven eight seven or a three whatever uh, yeah. right that's they they call them power plant for a reason because it not only generates thrust but it's running right. and so it, it's also just a motor that's generating power for right. lights and air conditioning and you know all the movies and video games we have now uh you know yep. in, in our in our nice fancy seats uh you know yep. in flight um yeah right it's generating all the utility power for the craft in a, in addition to also being the, the the source of thrust exactly so so, so how do, how does that change things um, uh, yeah well i think well i think it's you know Space is dark, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and that means there's, there isn't mu there's not much light. So you, everyone everyone uses at the moment every satellite is a box with panels kind of sticking out of it, and those panels are the, the solar panels. They're creating the the power, the watts to feed into your eye thruster or your instruments, your payload. But that doesn't work as soon as you get outside the asteroid belt. It's mm -hmm. all these Voyager One, Voyager Two. They all use these radioisotope thermal generators. Every one of these science missions that's gone outside of the asteroid belt. That's the kind of the end of where you can use solar panels. And so we need to think about what other power sources out there. Yeah. And also as well, what other power sources we can produce that can produce big amounts of power in space. At the moment, like the International Space Station, huge solar panels, you know, absolutely yeah. huge, size of football field. It produces 100 kilowatts, which is, <laughs> which isn't actually that much in any way. Right. You know, that's, a, that's 100 kettles or so, you know, compared yeah. to a power yeah. station, yeah. Yeah. Is, is, is frankly... That's nothing. Pitiful. <laughs> it's, it's not great. So, you know, there is a need to think about new power sources in space and new methods to kind of create that. Solar panels have been very useful, but uh, again, what's next? Yeah. Right. So you know we're um, we're we're coming up on our on our hour here. Um, what I'd love to think about is what are the next steps for people to take? Um, what are the next things to do um, in in this? Um, both for for yourself at the university, professor um, Richard and James, uh, for you gents, uh, you know, with Pulsar, and also in general as as kind of civilization, humanity, etc. Um, what do we do next with this? This is clearly a major enabler. It's going to enable things like uh, asteroid mining in a reasonable timeline. Um, it's going to enable shuttles between, you know, Earth, Moon, Mars, and, and that circuit. Uh, so, so okay, I mean, awesome. So, what do we do now to make it happen? Mm. Um, I'll I'll start by giving what what I think is kind of the, the our, our company's doctrine, which is just shut up and build stuff. Like really hard, we get get really uh, aggressive on hardware prototyping because you don't learn um as, as much as you need to if 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 you're if you exist purely in the world uh of, of simulation so there's a what there's a lot of questions we need to answer on things like material sciences and just just like just the the tedious hard engineering questions that you always have to answer we just need to go we need, we need to we need to prototype aggressively um uh, to drive this forward that's what i would say right but it also sounds like it's not in the realm of theory or basic physics research this right. is at the realm of we're building them we're breaking them and we're building them better on the next yeah. generation that's it and so what it. is needed to make that happen i mean professor do you need more grad students well, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know pulsar you know in investors you know are, are is this ready to be fielded um well it, it, i'm i'm a, a hands-on engineering i'm academic you know so uh, you know I, I i and i've got a big vacuum chambers here Kind of thing. I, I, I think we need to build these things and uh, demonstrate them and 
show that these that these operate well. Um, you know, I think they they uh, they look good from the from the physics side. Look, you know, they, they look interesting and possible. So, um, you know, we need to actually kind of develop them, move up the old the old boring TOL levels. You know, mm -hmm. that's always that's how right. they so find the technical the level. <laughs> the TRL ladder. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I've lived by uh, that for, not very exciting, but it's kind of the yeah. uh, end game kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, and Richard, your your thoughts. Um, I, I look, there is uh, beyond all the, I guess, the enthusiasm and the, and the greater picture, there is a massive amount of physics. Um, and we haven't, as James said, a lot of people come away and they say fusion. We haven't cracked fusion. Yeah, people cracked fusion. Yeah, that's a really, that's a that's the wrong uh, question to be asking because fusion, you know, the, the cracking it is can you achieve the temperature of a star? That's one thing. Can you use it for energy? That's a different thing. Can you use it for repulsion? That's right. a different thing. Right. So they're asking the wrong question. Right. The, the wrong question is can humanity achieve the conditions in fusion? Yes, we can. Yes, we've done it. The second question is, uh, what is needed to be done to make that open up these technologies that we can all see in our fields doing what we're doing and, and what we all, all of us who have actually worked in it very close, we, we know and what, to, to how to build, build that out and something that can be done now. What's missing? It's actually lots and lots of little innovations it's not one big it's not no one's going to sit in the bar write an equation down and run down the road screaming going oh, we've cracked fusion everyone's now going to turn on their reactors and they're all going to work it's little things like someone at a university will come up with a way that we can inject argon into a plasma and have um you know photon for radiate uh, you know radiative cooling or mm. Or, you know, by someone accidentally um, washes a, a reactor out using an anitronic uh, plasma like helium and finds out that we get H mode out of it mm. by chance because they built it, they were trying it, they're messing around with it. And these little tiny yeah. things bring up the efficiency just by one degree. And that actual mm. compounding effect of that is when you've got something like fusion is life, you know, world changing. So we need lots of people in labs all over the world to make little innovations that we can apply to this technology. And then rather than a, a one-off cracking event, those innovations will drive us to open up all of the things that we've been talking about. And they're much closer than I think people realize. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that, that that's amazing. So the physics is there, the, the you know capability of applying it is there and the commercial cases are there. So it sounds, you know, this is really exciting. Um, thank you, uh, all three of you, uh, Professor Ryan, uh, Richard, and James, um, for, for joining us. This has been really fun chatting with you, uh, gentlemen. Um, and, you know, the topic is just, it's one of my favorite topics, um, is, fu you know, fusion uh, and what it's going to do for us. And I spent, so I spent 10 years kind of working around fusion as an energy source. It's amazing to realize that 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 work you know some of that work um, is going to contribute to fusion as yeah. a as as a uh, source of propulsion and power you know uh, off off world um, once again to our audience thank you very much for joining us uh, on space talks with z uh, of the america's future series um, please do check out our other events the space uh, innovation symposium uh, i believe sir richard uh, branson will be joining us again this year um, and uh, we'll also have a, a host of other folks. Uh, it's going to be really great. Uh, so check that out. Bye for now. Bye.